Good morning, Gospel Church. Hope your week was a good one. I would like to welcome all of you, our members and our visitors that are tuning in to the program today. I would also love to um, congratulate Clive March on his 75th birthday this coming Monday the 8th. God bless you. Pastor Ray Eaton is our speaker for today and I would like to um, read for you the following verses that we find in Genesis 45, 7 to 8. And this is Joseph talking to his brothers. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father, a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hope you enjoy the program today. Good morning and happy Sabbath. And we'd like to invite you guys to sing with us today. And we're going to start with This Is The Day.
In last week's bulletin, Paul Race put a treasurer's report in giving us an update on church finances this year. I want to thank each person for faithfully supporting the church each week through their tithes and offerings. If you look at the rec this week's record online, you'll see a report there that says tithe is actually up 3.2% across Australia for the first four months of this year compared to last year. That's an amazing result and I want to thank the Lord for the way that he has been blessing the church. We are indeed blessed in this country of Australia compared to the rest of the world. I just want to read a couple of texts to you just to remind you of some of the importance that we need to remember of what happens when we're being blessed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. If we're expecting big things for the Lord, we need to sow generously. We go to verse 11, and this is the big thing for us to take note of. It says, You will be made rich in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to the Lord. This week in our offering, we have the special chance to help Avondale College students. Avondale's on our doorstep. Many of the people at church have attended Avondale, or the children are there. During the pandemic, some of the students here have been quite affected with having to be sent home from studies, studying um, online. And this week's offering is to really help Avondale and the students during this time of need. Many of our ministers, teachers and nurses are trained at Avondale and we need them in church employment. We need them well, uh, young people well trained. I want to encourage you this week to support generously Avondale with your offering. The good news about this week's offering amounts of $2 or more are tax deductible. So remember that when you're giving your offering. You'll remember in the bulletin each week, we will remind you of the three ways that you can give your offering through the app, online, direct debit, and Paul will even come and collect it out of your glass jar if that's the way you've saved it up. So thank you again. Thank you for supporting Avondale College this week. It's such an important institution and I commend it to you. Thank you. Good morning. I invite you to bow with me as we pray on this wonderful Sabbath day. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as a group of believers in separate places on around the coast and the world, but together in spirit and in heart. We thank you that we can address you as our creator and our sustainer, our life giver, and our Redeemer. We um, especially appreciate that you brought us through this week, all in different experiences, with different challenges, but you've now brought us to this wonderful Sabbath day where we can pause and rest in your care. We um, all lack faith, we all have our shortcomings, and we confess them to you this morning. Sometimes we have short memories and forget where you've led us in the past. Sometimes we ignore your promptings. But we pray that um, as we listen today, as we sing today, as we um, let ourselves spend time in your, your space, that we will be able to hear your prompting, feel your love and be aware of your spirit in our, in our environment, 
and in their lives today. Thank you especially for the Sabbath, a special time and space that you created where we could come to spend time with you as individuals but also as a group. We thank you for the health of our nation, even though it's not as ideal as you intended. We thank you that as a country we've um, progressed through this pandemic thus far. And as individuals, you've given us as a church a special understanding of health, and we thank you for that. We thank you too for our families and the benefits that it gives, for our homes and shelter, but especially we thank you for your love and kindness and the security that uh, you offer us by, by your love and your death of your son on Calvary. So we ask now that you will bless our speaker, that you will draw us in and that we will be able to understand the message which you've set aside for us today. We um, especially ask that you be with those of our members who have not been well, think of Clive in particular, but we thank you for his faith and um, the generosity of spirit which he has shown to each of us. Think to Matt and Krista as they are now a long way away, that you'll be able to bless them in their new environment and they will be a blessing to the people that they meet with from week to week and each day. So we thank you now that we can call you our friend. We especially ask that you will show us what you want us to do Show us how to be your hands and feet. Give us motivation and courage for the future that we'll be able to stand up for you and that in this time of um, isolation that we'll be able to um, grow our faith in you and that you'll be able to bless us. So we pray now that you will help us to be a blessing to those we come across from day to day, and especially now on this Sabbath, that we'll be able to receive your blessing and know that um, it's come from you. So I pray that you'll go with us now and we look forward to a um, wonderful week ahead because we know that you love us and that you came to, to live and die for us. So we pray all these things in your wonderful name and look forward to a time when you come again soon. For Jesus' sake, Amen. Hello girls and boys. A children's story for you. I know that you're enjoying the worship hour, the singing, and especially now with the sermon coming on very, very soon. I'm standing here not far from the place where we live, next to a lake beside some amazing creation that God has made. I have a story for you right now. It's about Johnny. Johnny was a young boy, that tall, and he just had fun playing behind his house. There were fruit trees in neighbors' houses and backyards. And uh, one day his mom called him. She says, Johnny, you've got to come here. Okay, so he came and she said, we need to go to the barber for a haircut. What's wrong with my hair? He said, she said, look at it. It's so bushy, so big and a lot of curls. And we, we've got to get this cut before dad comes home from work. So, okay, so she took him by the hand. And they walked out of the house, down the yard, down outside onto the street, and walked down, down, down quite a long way. And he was sort of not very happy that he had to have a haircut because, you know, he was getting all those prickles afterwards, as you do when they cut your hair. So uncomfortable. And uh, as they walked along, on the one side there was the lake, on the other there were the trees, and it was just, just a beautiful day, but he wasn't happy. Finally, they came to the barber shop. They went over the hill, down below, on the left side was the shop. So they walked over to the shop. Mum knocked on the door. The gentleman opened and they stepped in. So this is the place where I'll have my hair cut. There was a huge mirror, lots of mirrors, a lot of big seats. There were people sitting there. Some were having their hair cut by another barber. Hmm, what's this, what is this going to be like, he wondered. Hmm. Then the barber came and because Johnny was so small, he picked him up and put him on this big seat facing the mirror. Johnny thought to himself, wow, this is like sitting on a throne. And there in front of him was the picture of himself, a mirror. He saw this huge curly hair 
And then the barber took out his scissors. They were monstrous. And then he picked up a bit of his hair and cut it off. Swish, dropped it down. And another bit, swish, dropped it down. And then he had it all on the floor. From after a while, he realized he didn't have much hair left. And he thought to himself that he looked not very nice at all. You know, when it was all finished, he was so upset inside himself. He was wondering whether anybody would recognize him. So mum paid. They left the barber shop and went back home the way they came. On the left side was the lake, and now on the right were the trees. But as they were walking, he was getting so and so more and more angry and sighed and upset what his friends would think of him that he couldn't, he couldn't feel happy. And then he saw a friend from school. She was riding a bike. Her name was Mary. She was coming right towards him. And as she came close, he lifted his hand up and said, Hi, Mary. And Mary looked at him, took one look and, took, and looked aside. She didn't even say a word. So he concluded. He concluded that he looked ugly. She didn't recognize him. But then it happened again. And when another one of his friends was going by, he greeted him again. And his friend looked up at him and then looked again and then he went aside, didn't even respond. Oh, I must look awful, he said. So when he got home, he decided that he would do something. And he was so angry that he decided to do something nasty. Oh, that's not a very nice thing to do, but he did it. He got a cat, his sister's cat. He got a toothpaste from the bathroom and squeezed it all over the cat. And then he let it go. Hmm. Well, there it was. He thought he was feeling better now. Not for long. Because now he thought he'd do something else that wasn't nice. He went out of the house, down the staircase, over the fence, into the neighbor's yard and came to the tree, the orchard tree with all the apples growing on it. And he began to shake the tree down more and more. And as he shook it, all the apples just fell to the ground all around him. He hoped nobody was watching, so he quickly made his way back to the house, opened the door, went to his bedroom, locked himself in, threw himself into the bed and thought, ah, oh, that feels better. But not for long, because he heard a knock on the door. And there, as he peeped through the window, he could see the neighbor. Oh, she is knocking on the door. Will she tell him off? Did she see anything that happened? So he quickly went into his bed, covered himself up, then mom opened the door, and as mom spoke to, to the neighbor, he could hear the anger in her voice. She called at Johnny and said, Johnny, come here. And finally made his way out of the room, faced the mom, and mom says, did you take those apples down from that app? Did you shake them down? And he said, no. And then he caught himself, not telling the truth. And then he said, mm, yes, mom, I did. I'm sorry, but they didn't have time to finish. When his sister came screaming around the corner, she said, what's happened to my cat? Somebody's put toothpaste all over it. And mum looked at Johnny and said, did you do that too? No, 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 mum. And then he realized he was not telling the truth. And that was not right. So he said, yes, I did, mum. I'm so sorry. Well, you know, mum was a kind lady. She did say this. Johnny, if you can go back and get everything put right the way it was, then I'll forgive you. Oh, yes, Mommy, I'll, I'll do that right away. So he quickly went down into the neighbor's yard, found all those apples that were down on the ground. You know how they are, so beautiful and red. And, and he, uh, he, he, picked, he put, picked them up from the ground and he put them back on the tree one after another, and he left them there. Oh, he left, and then the sister came around and he found the cat and he picked the cat up and got the empty toothpaste and he began to suck it back into the toothpaste, all the toothpaste from the cat, and then cat didn't have any more toothpaste. And by this time, I'm looking at you and I'm wondering, what are your thoughts? Do you think that Johnny could actually do that?
and put the apples back on the apple tree? You know it's not true. You know he can't return the apples once they are taken off the tree. They always are loose. You can't connect them again. And by the way, once you sque squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube, you can never suck it back in. So you see, my precious friends, remember, there are some things in life, once you do them, you can't take them back. You can't. And you know, one of those things is saying the things. You, you, you've got to, uh, when, you, when you say things to your friends or to your teacher or to your mum and dad, we have to always pray and ask Jesus to help us so we can say the right things. Because once you say the wrong thing, you can never take those words back. They're always remembered by everyone and by you too. Jesus will forgive you. The people may forgive you. But so often it is hard to forget. So the best thing is that we never say the wrong things in the first place. And Jesus is there to help you. Please be blessed until we see you again. Bye for now. Morning, everybody. I am thrilled to be here this morning. But I'm a little sad because you're not here. You know, I remember when I first learned or was learning public speaking, somebody said to me, they're only cabbages, don't be afraid. Well, I've never spoken to an empty church before, but the word cabbage comes back to me because you're not cabbages, but normally we are eating lunch right after church on the first Sabbath of the month, and I'm going to miss that today. But I am happy to be here, to be with you in your home or wherever you might be. God sent a man. It was the Duke of um, Osana in uh, Spain. He was down at Barcelona. And when he was down there, he went down to the ships to see the criminals that were in the boat. He wanted to find out why they were there. And, you know, as he walked around, every one of them had an excuse as to why he was in prison. Somebody else was responsible. Somebody else had done something. He was paying the consequences of somebody else's error. You know, he got to about nearly the last one, in fact, the last person that he got there. And he walked down to this man and he said, tell me, why are you here? And he said, Your Honour, I am here because I deserve to be here. He said, I got into the habit of stealing little things, bigger things and bigger things. And now I am here paying the community for what I did, for my misdemeanor. Well, the Duke just hit the bell. He called out, take this man out of here from all these good people. He will pollute them. That man was taken out and the Duke followed him out, grabbed a piece of paper and wrote across, right across the centre, pardoned. He looked at that man and he said, man, I want to tell you, you have served long enough. We need men like you in our community. We need you in our society. Honesty, kindness, repentance certainly pays. You know, some of us often, we try to show God how good we are or how godly we are by the good things we do. We do all sorts of things. That is Babylonian religion. God's religion is to come to him as we are, admit what we are, and seek his forgiveness, seek his righteousness, and walk with him. Remember last time we saw this in the life of Joseph? God called a man, number one. Let's review that scene just for a moment and see what, what we saw there. Joseph grew up in a rural village. And in that rural village... I don't think there was corrugated iron, as you see here, but this is a picture I got off the internet. But there were, there were tarpaulins or sheepskins that their houses or tents were made out of. He learned many stories in that environment. He used to go to his grandfather's place, and his granddad told him stories of creation, of a big flood, and how that there was a God. 
He also told him a very interesting story one time of how that his granddad was just a boy and he and his father were going up to, to uh, worship. And as they're going to worship, the father tied this boy up and put him on the altar and then lifted the knife, was going to kill the boy. And he said, as he lifted that knife, a voice from heaven yelled out, Stop! He said, I learned that day that God would provide himself a sacrifice. God would provide himself a lamb. I never forgot that story. And then he went on to tell another story. And this story was how that he and his brother, they were twins, and they got along very well together as little children. But as they got older, all oh, their ways parted and parted dramatically. This grandfather had been quite dishonest and the uncle had gotten so angry it wasn't grandfather who's told the story about his dad and how his dad and his uncle were were twins and gotten on along well together but how that they had a big fight and the uncle was going to kill his dad and his dad had to run away he ran out in the desert and when he got out in the desert he had to go to sleep and so he wrapped his coat around himself but he just couldn't sleep so he got up and got a rock and made a rock for a pillow, wrapped himself up, put his head on the pillow, and he went fast asleep. And in his sleep, he saw a massive ladder between earth and heaven, and angels going up and down, up and down. And he discovered in that story that it doesn't matter how naughty you've been, it doesn't matter how bad you've been, how guilty you may are, God doesn't leave you. He learned that day, bring your troubles to him to talk to God. But then Joseph himself, he had stories. He was favoured and that brought jealousy. And his brothers were not only jealous, they hated him and they hated him vitriolically. Joseph had a motto and that was, more surely is there a place prepared for you to work for God on earth than there's a place prepared for you in heaven. And so Joseph went out to serve his brothers one day to take them things from dad and they grabbed him, they beat him, they threw him into a pit and then they sold him to the Ishmaelites as a slave and he was taken to Egypt. You know, before Joseph got to Egypt, he had made up his mind what he was going to do. He made up his mind that he was going to be true to God and true to conscience. He was sold to a big man down there by the name of Potiphar. Now, Potiphar was the Boris Johnson, the um, Scott Morrison, the Donald Trump, the Vladimir Putin, or maybe the Xi Jinping of his day. He was a very important person. And I'd like you to notice what happened when Joseph went and served in the house of Potiphar. Have a look over here in the book of Genesis, chapter 39, and it's recorded in verses 1 to 6. And it says there, Joseph was sold to Potiphar and became a very successful person. The Lord blessed Joseph. The Lord made him the head of the whole household, slaves and free alike. Potiphar did not even know what he had because he had entrusted everything to Joseph. Now, Joseph was a very handsome young man. He was a real celebrity. And you can read that story a little bit later on. You know, it looks as though being a slave in, Bab uh, in Egypt did not hurt Joseph. Everything in this house was under his control. In fact, I think you could say that Joseph was happy. He was happy in Egypt. He was happy down there. Why was it? You see, he would not let slavery, he would not let captivity rob him of his freedom. These experiences... Joseph rose higher and higher. Let me give another example of a more modern Joseph. There was a lady when I was a little boy, I remember hearing stories about this girl. She was blind. She'd been blind all her life. And she wrote this statement. Although I'm blind and cannot see, I will not complain or be bitter. I cannot and I won't. Helen Keller. But what about us? When things go wrong, when things are hard, when things are not fair, how do we react? Now, going back to Joseph and the environment Joseph was in, I'd love to tell you a story about a friend of mine. Bill was a very good friend. 
he was working in overseas. And when he was working there, he had a little lead foot. He would always go faster than what the speed limit said. And one day he was racing down the road, only doing 70, but it was a 50 or 60 kilometre zone. And he was caught and he was booked. And the policeman got out his book and wrote out the ticket and gave him all the detail. And then it said, this is $90 and I'm calling around to your office to pick it up on Monday. <clears throat> Bill's little boy. The government must be getting short of money to be calling to pick up their bills. <clears throat> sure enough, Monday morning, that man turned up with a receipt book and he gave Bill a receipt for $90 and walked out of the office. And Bill thought to himself, you know, that's strange. I wonder if this is really genuine. And so he rang the commissioner of police and said, Commissioner, I'd like to ask two questions this morning. Yes, what would you like? Firstly, if I'm doing 60 or 70 kilometres in a 60 zone, how much would I be fined? Oh, he said, that would be $30. Ah. He said, what about... Uh, if the policeman booked me and I had to pay the bill, would he call to my office to pick up the account or would I have to go down? Oh, no, he said, you've got to make that. That's your arrangement. Well, he said, Your Honour, I have a receipt here for $90 where I have been booked and I would like you to just check on this one for me, please. Well, that commissioner was very, very interested. He said, I'll be back to see you. And sure enough, he was back up there a few minutes later and he had a young man with him. And the young man had a receipt for $60 and Bill had his receipt for $90. What's going on? That young man had been booking people and pocketing $30. He lost his job. He lost his dignity. He lost his, his prestige. He was sent out. You know, Joseph could easily have been pocketing much from, from uh, Potiphar. But no, he was above that. He learned in Potiphar's house. Not only was he a slave, he was the head of the slaves. He was head of everything in that place. God trusted Joseph and Joseph trusted God, although he could not see that God had any plan for him in this situation. Joseph learned how modern governments work. He learned from dignitaries to, that came to the palace to see the people there. He learned lots about their conversations. He learned how to eat with cutlery instead of just fingers. Joseph learned about economics, social welfare, political science. You see, being a slave, even being in a put, pit, did not hurt Joseph. Why? Because Joseph did not allow it to hurt Joseph. It was unpleasant. It wasn't fair. It was frightening. But it was a, in this calamity, was an opportunity. And God used Joseph in this story. More surely, that was his motto, more surely is there a place prepared for you to work for God on earth than there's a place prepared for you in heaven. Just imagine if Joseph had been successful. Just imagine if Joseph had wanted to escape. Suppose that he had gotten away. What would have happened? Well, there would have been, at home, there would have been a massive party. There would have been lots of rejoicing. There would have been no imprisonment. But you know what? There also would have been no one there to interpret the baker's or the butler's dream. There would have been no one there to interpret Pharaoh's dream. Joseph would never have become prime minister of Egypt. There would not have been any grain stored for the time of drought and for God's people that were living in another country. In fact, they would never have become a large nation. They would never have conquered Canaan. There would not have been a King David or a Christian church. You see, there was a lot hanging on the story of Joseph. We wouldn't be here if Joseph had failed in God's plan. Kindness certainly pays and Joseph responded. All right, coming down to Potiphar again, Potiphar's home. You remember the story of Potiphar's wife and you can read that in chapter 39, Genesis 39. But in that story, Joseph learned very quickly two words and only three letters each. 
God and sin. And we see in that story Joseph's attitude toward both God and sin. How can I? And sin against God. Well, I want to go back to Dotham for a moment because Dotham was where Joseph was thrown into a pit. This place is only mentioned twice in Scripture, but both times it is a place of destruction, a place of privation, a place of ruin. But out of that, God has brought success. God has brought deliverance each time. Now I'm thinking of this coronavirus that is hitting us so strongly all around the world. It's wreaking havoc. It's causing ruin. Is God able out of this situation to bring any good, to bring something out of this hopelessness? Well, let's go back to Dotham and see. This is Joseph's coronavirus. It wasn't only Joseph's, mind you. There's, I said it was mentioned twice. The other one was Elisha. Now, you can read Elisha's story in 2 Kings chapter 6. And they were surrounded by the king of Syria. Why was it that they were surrounded by the king of Syria? You see, Elisha had been telling the king of Israel the movements of the king of Syria. And he became so angry that he marched straight down to Dotham so that he could take Elisha captive. And he had thousands, thousands of, of uh, soldiers there. They surrounded the house. They had him blocked in. And Elisha walked out. And he said, you fellows, you've come to the wrong place. They were blind. They couldn't see. And he said, I'll take you to where you need to go. And so he marched them. He marched them for 35 kilometers to a place called Samaria, where his own king was, where his own army was. And they were surrounded now by the enemy, by their enemy. And as they were taken there, the king said, we've got them. Shall we kill them? Shall we kill them? No, 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 Elisha said, don't kill them. Feed them. Give them a feed. Give them a party. Look after them. You know, that army returned home to their king and they never came back. Israel had peace. Israel had security from Syria for many, many years. Why? Because God's attitude of kindness certainly paid. Elisha was a type of Christ. What do I mean by that? Well, he sent messages many times to his people. He came to save his people from their enemy. He opened their eyes and he gave them food. Does that remind you of what Jesus did? We are surrounded by corona. It is threatening our everyday living. It is threatening to destroy us. Can any good thing come out of this? Man's extremity very often is God's opportunity. So let's stay with Dothan. I'm going to go to Joseph now and just see Joseph's experience in Dothan and how that Joseph also was a picture of Jesus. Joseph went down to Dothan to his brothers and they received him not. Jesus went down to his own and they received him not, according to John. Joseph was sold for money. Jesus was sold for money. Joseph was stripped of his clothing and beaten. Jesus was stripped of his clothing and beaten. We can read the Bible through and through and we never find any sin or any fault in Joseph. When Pilate stood up with Jesus in judgment, he bawled out, I find no fault in this man. Joseph was humiliated. Joseph was spat upon and put in prison. Jesus was spat upon and thrust into prison. Joseph brought a blessing to the baker, uh, the butler, sorry, and judgment to the baker. Jesus brought hope and salvation to the repentant sinner, and he brought judgment to the impenitent sinner. You see, in many ways, Joseph's life's parallels the life of Jesus. God did send a man and God did send another man and God is still sending people. God never promises a flower-strewn pathway, but he has promised 
and we can take this with us into the corona or anywhere else. God has promised, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Let me rush on quickly to Genesis chapter 41. You remember how the King Pharaoh had some very strange dreams and Joseph was called upon to interpret the dreams? Seven beautiful big fat cows and seven miserable wormy skinny cows. And the skinny cows ate up the fat cows and never got any bigger. Then he saw another dream. And in this dream, he saw one stalk of corn, one, one plant with seven beautiful big cobs of corn coming off it, massive cobs of corn. And then he saw a spindly, a weedy, a rusty looking corn growing up with, with blighty looking cobs on it. And the thin, miserable, ugly cobs ate up the big ones and they never got any bigger. What on earth can it mean? What could it be? Joseph, Joseph was called to interpret it. And when Joseph told Pharaoh the meaning of his dream, when Joseph told him the solution to the, dream, uh, the meaning of his dream and that God was sending a message that the king was to be prepared for this time. Well, chapter 41 tells us that Joseph was made head of everything, made head of the household of the king. There was going to be a terrible drought. And Joseph was to plan for that drought. And what did he do? He introduced a taxation system, 20% food tax. Now, I think you can see where Joseph came from to be very keen on taxes. When I was in Egypt, we were shown a place where they told us had been a massive storage area for grains. In fact, one guide said, this is traditionally where Joseph stored all the grain. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not. But what I do know is this story is known in that area. This story is known and is told. This drought not only affected Egypt, it affected all the Middle East area because up in Israel, they were dying because of the drought. Let's come on a little further. Jacob, Jacob in Israel, he heard that there was food being sold in Egypt. So he said to his boys, boys, I want you to go down to Egypt and buy food that we may live. We're going to die here. And so the family went down. And when they got to Egypt, they were recognized. They were accused. You are spies. You've seen that we are naked and you, you're down here to find out where our weak spots are. You're spies. And the brothers said, we are not spies. And then they said to each other, this is happening to us because of what we did to Joseph. They didn't know that Joseph was the one that was testing them. This is happening to us because of what we did to Joseph at Dotham. That's why this is here. They told this governor that they were not spies, that they were the sons of one man, that they had another brother at home. They did have another brother previously and he had died and they went on with all their history and Joseph could endure it no longer. He ran out and he wept. Joseph cried. He couldn't control his emotions. Well, they went off with their grain. They went back home. And as they were going back home, the first night, they opened their sack to give the donkey something to eat. And there was the money in their own bags. The money and the grain was all there. They hadn't paid for it. Oh, now they were dead scared. They were very fearful in case when they came back, 12 months later, they were out of food. They had to go again. But they had told this fellow they had another brother. And he had told them, you've got to bring that other brother with you. And so the dad said, okay, you boys, we've got to go back to Egypt and get some food. They said, we're not going. They said, what do you mean? We're not going. Why aren't you going? We're not going without Benjamin. You can't take Benjamin. But we're not going without Benjamin. We may as well die here as die down there. Well, Joseph, uh, Jacob caved in and let Benjamin go. And they got down there. Well, when they were coming into Egypt, they were recognised. Guess who was looking for them? He said to his servants, go and take that gang, take that group down to my house. He had water for them to drink, water for them to wash their feet. There was food for the donkeys. And he said, we're preparing a meal for these men. 
and they came into the meal and here they were, they were seated in their ages all the way around, right down to where Benjamin was and Benjamin had five times as much as they did. Well, they were shocked. They got their grain and they headed back home. They wanted to pay double and so they got, home, got going home. But as they were going, they saw a cloud of dust following them. And as they looked back, here was an army coming after them, yelling, shouting, making a big noise. Stop, you thief! Stop, you thief! Well, they stopped, all right. They were not going to try to run away from this. And then they said, who stole the cup? We wouldn't steal a cup. Someone has stolen our master's cup. Another test. Sure enough, that cup was found in Benjamin and sack. Every one of those brothers volunteered to come back and pay the price of the cup. Slavery, slaughter, whatever it might be, as long as Benjamin could go home. Oh, Joseph saw that those brothers were different now to what they were when he was a young man. Joseph was testing them again. Well, what happened there? Joseph can control himself no longer. He runs out and he weeps. And as he comes in, he cries out, I am Joseph. I am your brother. Is dad still well? He cried. He hugged his brothers. Don't damn yourselves. God sent me here. God sent me to prepare for this massive drought. It was God, not you, who sent me out. Go and tell dad, go home. Bring dad down here. You've got to come and live in Egypt. There's five more years of this drought. It's a terrible drought. They admitted their guilt. They repented. They reformed. They were sorry for what they had done. You know, kindness pays. Joseph repaid his brothers in full. God sent a man. And God is still sending people. There was a young man when I was a young person. He wanted to be a doctor. And so he went out house to house selling literature. He was selling books. And as he went out, he went to a home, a rural area, and he went there and there was only a young lady about his age that was there. And so he went, tried canvassing her, telling her what he was doing and so forth. And she looked at him very kindly, and she said, we don't have any money. I couldn't afford. Mum and Dad won't be able to buy books, I'm sure. Uh, Kelly saw that it was, you know, useless trying to push there, and he said, look, he said, it's hot and dusty out here. Could you give me a glass of water before I go? Oh, she said, we can do far better than that. And off she waddled down to the cellar, and she came back with a, a bucket of milk, and she gave him a beautiful glass of milk. She said, would you have more? Would you have more? And he said, thank you so much. Well, he graduated. He became a doctor. He became a surgeon. He became a specialist. And one day in his surgery, he saw a face and he said to himself, I know that person. Now, who is it? And he couldn't work out who it was, so he sent down to the office and got her card, where she was from. What? Oh, he said, that's that young lady that gave me the glass of milk. You know, she was shifted immediately from a public ward. She was placed in a private ward. She had a secretary. You'd think she was in ICU. People there to look after her. Every whim was looked after. And she recovered well. She was ready to go home. And she was sitting on the side of her bed and she was weeping. The nurse said to her, what's the matter? What is the problem? She said, look, I can never pay for what I have had here. She said, I didn't ask to be a private patient. How can I pay for all the benefits that I have received? I've recovered well. And the nurse said to her, you don't worry about that. Let me go and get your bill. And so she went down. She went down to the registry or down to the office. She got the bill and she came back and written right across that bill, paid in full with a glass of milk. Signed, H.A. Kelly. Kindness certainly pays. Joseph 
was kind to Potiphar. He was kind to the baker. He was kind to the butler. He was kind to the prisoners. He was kind to Pharaoh. Why did he do it? Now, I think Paul gives us exactly the same reason why he did it. It is the love of Christ that motivates us. And our actions, our kindness, reflects the God we serve. Father in heaven, we want to thank you today that we have experiences, we have people that have gone before and there have been great reflections of you. Lord, we'd like to pray that as we go out today, that as we walk with you, that we too may be reflectors of you and people can say, God sent a man. Amen.